Um, I wanted to first uh, just thank everyone so much for joining us today. Uh, this is a part of our uh, webinar Wednesday, uh, a professional development web series uh, for the college access and admissions community presented by collegegreenlight.com. And uh, we are back with today's uh, topic, unadvertised college resources and hidden barriers to support first gen and under-resourced students. And we are so grateful to have our admissions friends at Gettysburg today joining us providing insights to help students ask the right questions while attending upcoming college virtual info sessions and open hours. As mentioned before, I'm your host, Brittany Cleveland, Senior Manager of Partner Engagement here at collegegreenlight.com, where we support the needs of over 15,000 registered college access counselors and 200 leading colleges and universities across the nation, providing free online college admissions and scholarship resources for first-generation and under-resourced college-bound students. Launched in 2012 by CapEx.com, our mission continues to close the information and opportunity gap across access counselors and students, as well as their families. And if you're new to our community, we say hello, welcome to the green team. We welcome you and your students to create a free account at collegegreenlight.com. And once completed, you all will gain access to our user-friendly online tools to help students find scholarships to pay for school, research diversity admissions programs, and explore virtual campus tours. And if you all need any help creating accounts, type help in the chat box to the right or contact our team at info at collegegreenlight.com to get started. To maximize today's webinar, we have some housekeeping tips and goodies for you. First, last month, uh, College Greenlight, we hosted the online college block party, a two-day online college knowledge college, excuse me, conference dedicated to first-gen students. Nearly 4,000 high school students, parents, and counselors joined our sp special virtual event, gaining expert advice from diversity admissions representatives and current students from Colgate, Smith, University of California, Berkeley, Emory, Washington University in St. Louis, and Tufts. Topics range from COVID-19 and its impact on the college application, college cost savings, to College 101 for Spanish-speaking families. In the case you missed it, well, you are in luck. The online college blog party is back this June, so mark your calendars for June 3rd and 4th. College knowledge sessions will be led by current students and diversity reps at Harvard, Stanford, University of Michigan, Princeton, and University of Chicago. If you're interested in learning more, type party in the chat, and we will provide you with additional details for registration. And if you are interested in watching previously recorded info sessions from last online college black party, please visit the College Greenlight YouTube page. Now for some housekeeping tips. Use the chat box to your right or bottom of your screen to add comments. Have any questions? You can submit any questions or leave a comment on a question. An additional um, a Gettysburg team representative is in the audience to answer those questions. And you all will be able to view it in the answer tab. And you can also upvote questions that others have submitted. And if you need to leave early, we understand. We will be sending the slides and recording for you to review within 24 hours. And please don't forget, sharing is caring. Please forward this to friends, students, and colleagues. All right, team, on with the show. We bring you our panel, the Gettysburg Admissions Team, Daryl Jones, Senior Associate Director of Admissions, Coordinator for Multicultural Admissions. Courtney Bess, Senior Associate Director of Admissions, Coordinator of Western Recruitment. Dr. Darian Davenport, Executive Director, Office of Multicultural Engagement and Assistant Vice President of College Life. Additionally, Tyra Crosby and Marco Blasco from Gettysburg will be joining you all in the chat room, answering any questions that you all may have. All right, team, that's enough for me. I'm gonna go ahead and have you um, go and begin. Thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you all for joining us today. So here is what we hope to accomplish today. 
What we want to do is talk to you about all the things that happen when we're trying to guide our students to and through college. So even though we're going to talk to you a lot about what Gettysburg College does, today is really about understanding what the deep questions are that you should ask while guiding your students to success. It's all about how we avoid missing out on opportunities because of perceived financial cost. And then we're looking at some things that might be some hidden barriers to avoid so that our students, the students that you serve, have a full experience. So who are we and why do we care about this topic? I care because it's a space in which I live. I happen to be a first generation student. A lot of my family is of the age that higher education was not an option because of Jim Crow. And so with the generation that could, it was not about just getting access to education, but about finishing it. Courtney? Hi, everyone. My name's Courtney Best. and. I grew up in the DC area and actually attended Gettysburg. So I'm an alum class of 2001 and diversity has always been something that is near and dear to my heart. And especially moving out to the West Coast, I've seen the importance of access to higher education and building strong relationships with counselors. It's the most important part of this process, especially for these students looking to go across the country for school. So. I hope to support students and counselors in each step of the process. I'm going to turn it over to Darian. Hello, family. Uh, again, Darian Davenport. Um, part of this is, is personal as well as professional. Um, I'm a first generation student and actually had the privilege of being part of a college access program. That's how I got to college. Um, that was the only way I was able to get to college. So, you know, being on the other side now, I guess, of the desk. I get to provide wonderful support for all the students that you send to us. And I get to liaise with all of you individuals and, and kind of really build this community and this structure around these students so we can help them to be successful. So it, it's, it's personal, but it's professional and it's a, definitely a, a, labor, a labor in love. So we will pass it over back to Courtney, who's gonna take us through. All right, so we are just gonna dive in and we really hope to cover everything from the admissions process to basic needs and, and other opportunities. Uh, so let's kick it off with the admissions process. Um, there are so many things to think about, but really, especially, um, now that students are at home and we're thinking about fit and getting students to campus, um, it's, these are some good questions to ask. So how can you get students to visit? Um, are there, there are groups uh, from CBOs, rural organizations, charter schools all over? And how does admissions help with that? Do they pay for meals? Do they help with transportation? And I'm really proud because at Gettysburg, we are able to um, really support our visitors and we have meals because uh, this is a big part of sitting with the students and eating the food and seeing if this is going to be home for them. Um, we, we really try and help pay for um, some buses, vans, trains, just to help help some of these groups get to campus. Um, so please make sure as you're talking about visits, you're asking about transportation and if the college can help get you there. The second question really is talking about the fly-ins and other transportations and when does that happen for students and what is that process? And this is something that differs from school to school. So it, some schools have applications, some schools have limited spots, just do fall visits, just do spring visits. At Gettysburg, we really focus on the admitted student phase because we really want them to see their acceptance letter, their financial aid package, and we're asking students to come and spend two to three days on our campus to really get to know us so they can make that decision. And this is for all admitted students who have high need. Um, this year, of course, with COVID, we weren't able to do it, but what we did do is we focused on our high need first generation 
uh, community-based organization students, and we provided more virtual connections. So Darian, thank you, Darian, hosted something every week with current students. So our accepted students could make those connections. Our faculty and student panels, we just provided so many more resources virtually. Um, our, our fun staff has been doing some Instagram tours so people can actually see what campus looks like even if they physically can't be there. So um, please make sure you're asking about these different fly-in programs. Uh, and then uh, of course with, with this spring as well and tests being canceled, there's always this question about how are SATs and ACTs, uh, are schools test optional? How is this all reviewed? in um, the admissions process? Do we take into consideration if they're coming from rural areas, they're first generation or traditionally underrepresented? And that is something I'm also very proud of is um, at Gettysburg, of course, we super score the SAT and the ACT and we are test optional. We've been test optional for over 10 years. Um, I think we pay attention to national averages and we all are, are looking at what's going on, especially with the cancellation of tests this spring. And um, we are all territory managers. You're gonna hear me say that a lot. So it's it's our job to kind of know what's going on um, in the, the areas that we travel to and be able to put applications in that context. For our students that are applying test optional, we really pay a lot of attention to the strength of their transcript and what is available to them. Demonstrated interest. This is something that a lot a lot of more schools are talking about, but um, how, how to show this, especially the spring and throughout the year. Um, and this is something that we care about interest and we wanna learn as much as we can about a student and we want them to learn as much as they can about us. So throughout the year, we get to reach out to students at their organizations or their schools. Uh, we get to try and set up visits. If we're not doing it in person, we're gonna be doing it virtually, um, but we help with various workshops on different topics um, and, and really try and connect and make those opportunities available for students. And when you talk about demonstrated interest, one of the best ways to do that is through the interview. So asking, are there interviews required? Is that an option and where are they held? Um, we highly, highly, highly recommend the interview. And as I just mentioned, it's it's so important for us to learn about the students and hear their stories and, and learn about their experiences. Um, so we make our off-campus interviews accessible. So we look at accessible locations. Sometimes we partner with schools or community-based organizations and host them at your home office or a, a location or site close by. Um, for anyone who is coming to campus, we hold those on interviews on campus, as well as many of our CBO trips that spend the night, um, we have that opportunity included as part of their schedule to do an interview. How much of the staff is on the diversity recruitment team? This is a very good question and I, I hope you're asking this and I am so proud. This is my 20th year at Gettysburg and I am so proud that every single person in our admissions office is part of our diversity recruitment team. Our international admissions team, everyone is involved in diversity recruitment. We're, as I said before, we're all territory managers. So it is our job to connect with urban, rural, first generation schools and community organizations. Um, we often host off-campus interviews at some of these locations, uh, like I said, or we're always available for service-based recruitment, which includes workshops, speeches, presentations, essay review, mock interviews, case studies. And the final question on my slide is, does the admissions office accept advocacy calls? How, do, how can you best advocate, advocate for your students during the admissions review process? And as I've mentioned in my, my introduction, our relationships with you are so important. And so we really try and reach out to you, to schools, to community-based organizations, to um, programs, in our territories and and really we're setting up those advocacy calls so the burden's not on you to reach out. Um, these are typically the end of February, beginning of March for regular decision and maybe December or January for early decision. So we look forward to those conversations and getting any insight that you have about the student, especially at that time during their process. I'm gonna turn it over to my lovely colleague, Daryl. Oops. 
Courtney, thank you so much for all of those wonderful questions that you're providing our audience with, and we have more that you should ask every time you're dealing with a college or university. The first one is about the infamous non-custodial form for need-based financial aid. I know this makes us rare and it makes me sad about it, but at Gettysburg College, we don't require the non-custodial form for anyone. We think it's a real barrier. We think it causes, in some cases, psychological trauma. And part of my crusade, frankly, now that I'm in my 35th year in higher education, is to get more colleges and universities to stop requiring that when they can read on the application that there has been no contact, there is no known second person. We think it's the right thing to do and more people need to join us. Our institutional policy on undocumented students, I mean, we are maybe again rare in that we give some financial aid to undocumented students. Because of our location, which Courtney will talk about a little later, you know, we're close to Washington, D.C. and Baltimore and a few other urban areas. So our policy on admission is that we will accept students if they're from a drivable distance. Uh, you all know from the past several years, not to be political, but it is now dangerous for undocumented students, even if they've been here practically their, their whole lives, to take mass transit. So since our mass transit centers are our state capital only 45 minutes away in Baltimore and Washington, which are a little under and a little over an hour respectively, we want to only admit and aid students who are undocumented that are close by so that we put no one in danger at any time whatsoever. The next question you should ask every college and university is about how rural students are treated. How are they considered in admissions? So the way we do it is we treat them like any other underrepresented group. It's easy for colleges and universities to do their recruiting and admission from urban areas and suburban areas. But if you think about many rural schools in the nation, they, those students are also underserved. So we wanna make sure that we read those applications with the same human care that we would a student from one of our favorite organizations in the nation or any school that is urban. Really important for us to look at that group as we do any other underserved student. Our international admissions process is also part of our diversity efforts. So our teammates, Marco and Danielle, literally spend time in China, in Vietnam. They're reading applications and admitting students from Africa and many other continents so that we're both ethnically and culturally diversifying at the same time. Yes, it is true that all colleges and universities spend some time doing recruitment in Western Europe. But again, as Courtney mentioned, our entire team is doing diversity recruitment. So I'm glad to have an international effort that aids us there. So some changes, obviously, that happened with regard to COVID-19 where, as Courtney mentioned, we couldn't do our fly-in. It's a part of what we love. But we did do lots of virtual outreach, either individually or with schools or with community-based organizations throughout the nation. I spent quite a bit of time working here in Chicago. I happen to live in Evanston part-time, so I was able to match up a lot of my efforts with that group as well as New York. But part of what we also had to do is another obvious piece. Our financial aid staff has been absolutely tireless in repackaging people who might have initially had a very high need, but now had a full need because both parents were furloughed or the student might have been the only person working or for health reasons. So we will concern ourselves with what the cost was later, but I'm glad that as of this point, we have not lost a single current student, and we are able to accommodate so many new students through just being more generous with financial aid. 
The last question I have for me is about our institution's inclusion. This is something you should ask about at every college and university. So Gettysburg is in a unique spot right above the Mason-Dixon line. It was founded by abolitionists on land that was given by a famous abolitionist named Thaddeus Stevens. Fast forward to when David Wills, a Gettysburg alum, invited Abraham Lincoln to give what is still the world's most famous speech. So without Gettysburg College, the Gettysburg Address would not have happened. Later on, President Dwight Eisenhower, the president who was tough enough and brave enough to use the National Guard to integrate schools, actually was a trustee of Gettysburg College and used what is now the admissions office as his office following the presidency of the US. So inclusion is our conversation and it has been for a while. Diversity means you have it, inclusion means you embrace it. And now, I mean, there are so many other questions that you can ask certainly as a part of this process and we'd love to help you with more of those after this. But Courtney, let's give some tips to people. If you could start off with the first one, please. All right, I'm muted. <laughs> um, so please never, ever, ever exclude a college or university just because of that price tag, because we all know that there's financial aid and merit out there and we are trying to meet that student's need so they can come to our schools and stay for the entire time and get that financial support that they need. So please um, never exclude a school just based on price. And the second tip is you shouldn't exclude a college or university because of distance from home. Again, when we return to normal, colleges and universities will return to having fly-in programs, train-in programs, bus-in programs. So make sure that like we do with Gettysburg, your students are able to see a college or university under normal circumstances before they have to actually make a final decision. And Darian, if you could please take the third tip. So the third tip is always encourage students to be proud of their backgrounds and not to be apologetic. And, and one of the things, I, I get the privilege to do a lot of presentations uh, with my admissions partners. And any prospective student that comes, any group that comes, we really try to reinforce that when pr students present on campus, they're enrolled, that they bring their true and authentic selves, their backgrounds, their identities, everything that has shaped them to be the wonderful individuals that they are. Um, we want them to feel power in that. We not only want them to feel included, feel a sense of belonging and have a seat at that table, but also have a voice at that table. So it's really important. And, and with what I do in working with different college access programs and community-based organizations, is really having those conversations to make sure that we are walking with that student in lockstep. Um, we don't want them to feel like their identities are an impediment to their success. They will empower uh, their success. So we try to reinforce that it is so important when you're visiting colleges and universities to make sure that that is the messaging that you're receiving from these support and access areas. Next slide, please, Courtney. So um, I get the chance to go into basic needs. Again, my role is, you know, we, we stay very connected with our admissions partners. Um, I'm one the, the, you know, once folks get enrolled and they say, okay, you talked about these things during the process, who are, where, who are, where are they? And I am the who and where um, in those types of things. So we'll, we'll talk about basic needs, but the first thing, and I know that some of y'all, when you came in, were able to jump right into the live polls. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be polls there. So the first poll question is, and I see we have about 75 folks who have participated, and we have 554 of our closest friends. Uh, so please all jump in. Um, but the first poll question is, do you believe that financial aid should cover housing and utilities for students for whom housing is not guaranteed? And for as far as Gettysburg College, we guarantee housing for all four years. 
Uh, so if you're coming to Gettysburg College, you will be guaranteed a place. Shelter is important. Um, it is a basic need. So if you come to Gettysburg, um, that is something that we provide. Uh, so again, please feel free to jump into the live poll. Um, Courtney, we can go to our second live poll question. All right. Um, second live poll question is, have you dealt with institutions at which it is difficult to graduate in four years, but financial aid is not available after the fourth year, yes or no? And let's check the poll. About 37% of you said yes, 38%, and about 61% uh, percent said no. Um, Gettysburg College does not have uh, five-year programs. Our academic structure is geared towards attempting to get students um, through and to cross that stage in four years. That's really our purpose. Um, this should be something where they, they grow and, and our academic curriculum should be structured in a way that that growth is consistent, but also contained in that fourth year structure. So it's very important to us. Um, so thanks for your participation in the polls. We will have some polls later on. Over to Daryl. So with the next set of questions, these are basic needs questions that we should always ask when again, guiding our students to and through college. So the first one is about what Doc just mentioned about this process being a four year process. So at Gettysburg College, sometimes some things happen and you've seen that happen with your students. So if there's an interruption of a semester or two semesters, because of a family emergency, a personal health situation, or something of that sort, then that semester in which a student might leave early isn't carried on for that semester. So we are telling you that you should ask each time that if it takes more than four years, does financial assistance cover everything for four years? At Gettysburg, it does. And we hope that's the case with other places. The next question you should always ask is whether or not the financial aid award stays the same if family finances stay the same. What we know is that some colleges and universities do kind of a bait and switch. So they might give you a generous financial aid package in the first year and then force you to borrow quite a bit in the next three years. We keep things the same. As long as families' finances are the same, they can expect the same kind of financial aid package. If there are tuition increases, then certainly our financial aid awards will increase commensurate with that tuition increase. But again, you have to ask about all four years because some will talk about freshman aid this, freshman aid that, which means something hidden might be around the corner. So reflecting again on what happened when the unexpected happened this year, we were so very fortunate to have a financial aid staff that was actually able to handle the entire loss of job, furloughing, and all the other things that are a part of this COVID situation in which we find ourselves. So we do know that this is costing a lot more money for colleges and universities to catch up with these new aid circumstances but we think retention of people is important again that's the difference between access and success access means you got in success means that you were actually able to stay in and that is our mission Courtney, I'd like to have you talk about our next question about whether or not the college or university guarantees housing for four years. And if you could touch a little bit on the meal plan and things like that, that'd be great. All right. So um, again, these are just some additional questions you want to dig a little bit deeper and um, asking if colleges guarantee housing for four, for all four years. Um, even in some of these urban areas, we know how hard it is to find housing if, if it's not part of the college. Um, 
and food uh, that that is something uh, it's definitely one of the basic needs that we at Gettysburg make sure that all of our first years have an unlimited access to our dining hall so most use it two or three times but we have had the occasional student use it 10 times but um, it's really uh, there for them so they can have their their food and their energy and really uh, work through the busy schedule of balancing classes and clubs and organizations um, so asking about housing and food especially addressing some of those food security issues are there other other things available like um, I, doc's going to talk about we have uh, a a campus cupboard so if someone needs to do laundry you know are there there are ways for them to get some laundry detergent so they can have clean clothes um, so these are some of the additional questions that um, you want to make sure you're asking about uh, as far as housing and the meal plan so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Darian Davenport and flip the slide so formal everyone's so formal <laughs> we're all friends here um one of the questions you definitely want to ask is can students stay on campus during breaks uh, we know that um homelessness is rampant in in higher ed and circumstances change um you know you might have a student that has a solid first year structure and second or third year maybe it's changed right so asking the question of can they stay on on campus during breaks whether that if it's a traditional structure that large holiday break in you know in the winter can they stay on campus during that time um there are some students who might not be able to make it home during the summer uh, can they stay on campus then? So definitely something that you want to ask as you're going and discussing um, the possibility of your students attending um, these different colleges and universities. If so, who and what are the sources for meals? Food is a big deal. And, you know, unfortunately, some places when they shut down for a break, they shut their meal access down too. So a question to ask is, are there meals, are there things on campus? Unfortunately, at Gettysburg College, we, you know, can make sure that students have access to food around. Um, our dining facility has been phenomenal being able to provide that kind of access. Um, getting to and from, right? So if not, how do students get funding to leave campus? Um, we saw this in earlier, um, Daryl talked about, you know, things during COVID. So just to give you a quick example, um, we have a, a student emergency fund, and this is a, a great question to ask if, if colleges and universities have emergency funds. We have a student emergency fund. So when COVID hit and the state required us to shut down, we had the funding and, it, and it's, you know, funds that were donated. It started with a gift from the alum, um, funds that were just donated over time to help build this fund. But we were able to provide transportation for students to be able to get back home when they needed to. We had students who were internet, who are um, as part of study abroad programs that we had to bring back to the state. So we were able to do that. So having access to funding is really important, um, especially in situations where, where there are emergencies. The next one, um, what is the access to nearby transportation centers and what's the cost? Uh, you know, that's definitely location and access is really important question to ask. Um, one of the things that we have, we have a very robust transportation structure. So we can get students to and from um, for, you know, we're East Coast, we're close to Baltimore, Washington. So getting students to Dulles Airport, getting students to BWI Airport, Harrisburg, HIA um, International Airport is close to us. We have an Amtrak site, but we actually have a pretty robust shuttle program. We also have a program called, um, called it's called Break Shuttle. So during times for those who celebrate Thanksgiving, around Thanksgiving or the holidays, we actually have a shuttle that picks students up from campus and will take them to New York. They take them to New Jersey. Uh, so, you know, you definitely want to be able to look for those schools and the types of programs and accessibility because you don't want, you know, to be in a space where students need to get home and they can't. We all know how, how challenging that can be when you feel that way. Um, so definitely something uh, that you want to think about. Courtney earlier talked about um, the Mosaic Cupboard. Two years ago, we actually started a program where um, we had a, an alum, again, an alum that donated some money that we turned into a necessities cupboard or a necessities pantry. So we have students who, and we don't ask any questions, 
but we have students that will come and need toothpaste and toothbrushes and and deodorant and different things like that. Um, sometimes it's hard when students are on campus. We sometimes um, colleges and universities and they're doing a better job at it. But you know we have to acknowledge that life continues to happen in this academic space, right? So what can we do or what are colleges and universities doing to be able to support that? And we've been able to develop um, very robust programs to provide those, those, life, um, those life engaging um, needs. You know, it, it's hard to focus if you're hungry. It's hard to focus if you're worrying about your hygiene, right? So definitely questions you wanna ask as you're going to discuss these um, things with different colleges and universities. Is summer storage available for students' belongings? Um, you know, a lot of colleges and universities, and you're probably sending your students to colleges all across the country, right? If you're in California, maybe you send them to Illinois or, or um, Pennsylvania or Florida. Uh, but you know, like I know, people collect things. <laughs> students collect things. They purchase things all the time. And being able to haul things every year back and forth could be challenging. So one of the things you want to check, um, are there storage facilities on campus? Or are, is there access to storage um, or off campus? And we, you know, again, we've had the, the privilege of having storage facilities within walking distance of the college. Um, we've developed partnerships with different storage facilities just to make sure that our students, again, have access to those types of things. Uh, the next question is, many colleges and universities recruit nationally for talent. Is there an emergency fund to get home if needed and who gets it? Um, is it a loan or or a tax item? Um, actually, again, I talked a little bit about it earlier. Any student, enrolled student at Gettysburg College has access to the Student Emergency Fund. Um, it actually is a really simple process. They go on the website, they fill out a web form, and it goes to one person, and we turn those over um, anywhere between 24 to 48 hours. It's a really quick thing, um, and it's not a loan. It's not a loan. We, we give it and, you know, there are certain things that we outlined that we cannot provide. So if there are things that are already accounted for in their financial aid packaging or structure, like books, um, you know, a book can be an emergency in that kind of situation. But just to give you a quick example, we've had situations where maybe a student had a parent pass away and that ticket to get them home right away was six, seven, eight hundred dollars and they didn't have it. They could come to the emergency fund. We purchase that ticket right away and we get them home to be with their family. Um, so really, really important piece there. Um, it's also important to look at, you know, what types of programs have co-curricular support for your students. So we have a fund called the Myra T. Heron Fund, where we provide support for co-curricular interests because students might want to pursue certain things, but they don't have the funding to do it. So are there funding sources on those campuses to help realize some of the co-curricular dreams that our students have? So really important. Um, next question is, how did COVID, the COVID-19 situation affect any of the above? Uh, we, we actually um, jumped really quickly uh, at supporting our students. Um, our IT department is phenomenal. Uh, so, you know, realizing that, and, I, and a lot of you may have seen this too, that there are students that didn't, just didn't have access, right? They didn't have access to laptops. They didn't have access to, to Wi-Fi. So we were, we were sending laptops and hotspots to students all across the country to make sure that they didn't miss a step in their academic program. Uh, very important. So that's definitely a question you wanna ask. If, if you get into a rough situation or if a student needs access from a tech standpoint, because not every student comes with a cell phone or a laptop or thing. And yes, there might be campus, there might be Wi-Fi on campus, but does a student have to go to a lab to do things? You know, again, what type of access exists? Asking those types of things are important or when you get into an emergency, what's the process and protocol? Uh, with that, we also did a lot of fundraising um, for the Student Emergency Fund. We raised close to $100,000 uh, for the Student Emergency Fund to help support because people had needs, right? Things transition quickly for them. Some folks were going into situations that they were not financially pre prepared for, whether it was transportation, or just different essentials. So we received um, hundreds of requests for emergency funds and we were able to process those. And we had a lot of, you know, our community is phenomenal. Uh, that's an important piece too, when you're asking about some of these colleges and universities, um, what kind of culture and spirit does that, that institution have, right? Um, will they come together and rally to support their mission or support their students? 
very important thing. And, and that's one of the things that we've been uh, the beneficiaries of in that way. So that's kind of how we handled the, the COVID situation. Um, what is the closest healthcare facility to campus and uh, that offers services beyond typical healthcare center and how do students access it? So we actually have on campus um, health center and counseling center available for students. It is really close to campus. It is actually right next to our main dining hall, which is phenomenal, close to our college union building and not far from our residential facilities, uh, which is great. Uh, we have a hospital, which is about a mile south from our campus. There's another hospital in York. There's, an, there's Hershey Med, which a lot of folks worldwide have heard about Hershey Med. That's about 50 minutes, an uh, hour from us. We have uh, Johns Hopkins, which again, leading research hospital, right? So we geographically, we sit in a nice space as far as that type of access, but definitely something that you want to ask. Uh, students have slips and falls and challenges. You know, what type of process, what type of resources have colleges and universities invested in the healthcare piece, especially when we talk about mental health and, you know, students who might come to a college or university and need more mental health support because maybe they were getting a lot at home, right? Maybe they, they had a structure at home and now that structure's changed. So definitely something uh, that you want to um, ask. You flip the slide for me. Oh, thank you. You're so on it, Courtney. I appreciate you. <laughs> um, so the next question is, how do students pay for books and other associated costs? Our books, again, that, and if you go online, you can see it, you know, our books, we, we put that into our financial aid analysis for students. However, there are a lot of resources on campus. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, the Office of Multicultural Engagement has a book loan program. Um, a question that you can definitely ask different colleges and universities where, you know, if a student is presenting with a certain need with a book, we do a semester loan of a book. So, you know, asking about those different things and how they're working out. Uh, our faculty at the college have done a phenomenal job really pursuing and investigating open source. Um, you definitely want to ask that question when you get on campus to see if they're looking at open source materials um, to help supplement and not use traditional textbooks in their academic spaces. It is something that we've had science faculty do it. Our library has been a great partner. Um, you know, and, and again, when you're on these tours or you're having these conversations, where's the library? Where, you know, what, how are these folks involved in the process? Because sometimes we think books solely from the transactional piece of student to bookstore. But there are other resources and other things happening on campus to help support books, help, again, excuse me, students when they have a need. So just, again, a little bit of food for thought. You do the dishes, but books is, is, a, is, a, book, is a big deal there. Uh, next question. When it comes to support and inclusion on campus, who connects with the CBO, charter school, first gen, rural international, undocumented students? Is it one office uh, or many? Um, I will tell you, family, that is an important question to ask. Um, the investment that a college and university makes in these different areas is really important. Um, our, you know, our college, I've, I've worked at colleges, different colleges where all of the things listed in that question, I was that one person <laughs> doing that. Uh, and I've worked in spaces um, like at Gettysburg College where, you know, I have an area which is focused on CBOs and charter schools and first gen. I actually serve as a liaison for college access and college um, a CBO programs there. Um, we have a director of international student support. We have another area that works with undocumented students. So one of the things you want when you walk in the door and you're asking these questions, what types of resources have colleges and universities invested in the students that you're going to send there? Right. You're going to send these folks there. And if there's no one or nothing to help support them, not only in the transition and in their retention, but their ability to persist in college and be successful. It's one of the things you definitely want to think about. So, again, just putting it out there. Um, and we had a picture populate the slide. Oh, OK, sorry. Something happened there. We're going to keep it going, though. Uh, the next question is. Do any of the campus's power players understand the experience of these groups and the students uh, having from having lived it? What are those people and what are those positions? So, um, as I said earlier, I, I serve as the executive director for the Office of Multicultural Engagement, but also assistant vice president of college life. 
But when we talk about things such as diversity, inclusion, belonging, um, family, and colleges and universities, that has to come from the top. Uh, so our president, Bob Giuliano, has really done a good job making this, it, it's, not, it's not just a focal point, it is woven into the fabric of our society, right? It's a difference. Um, folks can have a bullet, they can have a goal, they can have wonderful things, or they can intentionally weave it into the fiber of their, of their institutions, right? Beyond mission, beyond vision, it becomes what you live. So we, we've done a really good job, and you want to see how colleges and universities are actually doing that. Um, just to give an example, as far as power players, our president actually has a student, a solely student organization for inclusion and belonging. And it's 10 students, first year to fourth year, all students, and that it's a direct line to him to give him feedback about things as far as diversity and equity and inclusion and belonging. So again, those having those folks involved, um, an institution that has a chief diversity officer, um, how many institutions have invested in those types of roles? So you want to see what's that structure look like, right? What are who are those people? Are they involved? Are they connected, um, or are they on divergent paths? Um, it's okay to ask some of those questions that might seem a little bit invasive at first, but it's up for us to answer them. Um, we express to you a certain mission and belief, and, and say that we're going to bring your students here, and they're going to be able to be the beneficiaries of a certain environment. You want to make sure that we're doing that, folks. You want to make sure that we are. So definitely something to think about. Um, how are bias incidents handled and by whom? We actually have a director of student rights and responsibility. So you, you want to look at discipline, right? Uh, discipline, but also support. Because it's not just punitive. It should be educational. So as it relates to bias-related incidents, you know, is there a reporting structure? You know, do they report the incidents? You know, as far as what's really going on, is that public? Can you see it? Can you go on a website and see? Uh, is there a person that's handling those things? And the third thing is, is there education behind it? Again, you can have a punitive aspect to it, but if we aren't, we're an educational institution. Colleges and universities are, you know, this is what we do, right? So are we taking these bias incidents, bias situations, and actually educating people and growing our communities for, through them? So again, that that's how that's how we handle them. Um, yeah, I would probably be bad if I said that's how they should be handled, right? <laughs> but, but when you go ask the question, I think it's really important to say, hey, if, if I send a student there and something happens, what's the process? What's the process? Because there, there can be, you know, when you're living there amongst folks and biases happen, um, folks are still living there and they're eating there. You want to make sure that that environment is maintaining or, or at least continuing a trend in a direction that is healthy, Okay. Um, so next live poll, third question, multicultural affairs offices are known as safe spaces on campus. Is there a potential for them to become self-segregating spaces, yes or no? And I know that there's, in the essence of time, I want to keep things moving, but I welcome folks to take, um, you know, take a look at the poll. And, and the second question, we can go to the next slide, is if you answer yes, is that a bad thing? Um, it's important to make sure that, the, you know, we talk about multi, right? It's important for these spaces to be open and inclusive and be bastions of discourse. It's really important. So while they might appear to be self-segregating, how can we create them where people can show up in those spaces and be and engage and grow from one another? Um, so just, again, in the essence of time, don't want to go too far down that path. We want to go ahead and keep things doing so. Um, next, we will go into the section where we talk about what it means to live the full student experience. And I will now pass it back to my colleague, Courtney. Thank you so much. And for that first question, you know, how are first year classes chosen? We have a lot of students asking that right now. And who's there to really help the students make these decisions? What does advising look like over the four years, not just that first year? So um, we're, again, pretty lucky at Gettysburg because we have lovely academic advising and faculty who volunteer to help these first years really select their courses in June. And then our students get to write a letter to their faculty right before they get to campus and tell them who they are and what their goals are and what their passions are, what they hope to accomplish. And then part of our orientation is they actually sit down knee to knee with their advisor and they go over those classes they signed up for and make sure it's the right the right set of courses 
for, for that fall semester. And then once they get into their majors and minors, they get more advisors. And, and these are not just advisors, but they're mentors. They become friends. Um, some of our students have invited them to their, their weddings, <laughs> uh, but they really, they really try and get to know the student, not just on an academic level, but on a personal level as well, and give them the advice they need to continue in their degree, but also explore courses that they might not have considered before. And I'm gonna turn it over to Darian. So next question is, what are the programs that help students make an adjustment from their homes to campuses? Who administers them? Who is this, who is served by them? And are there special programs for CBO charter rule, first gen international and document and other underserved populations? Uh, one of the things I would encourage you to do um, is look at, yes, um, look at programs or look at institutions that have uh, pre-orientation programs, a program where a student can come to campus three or four days earlier than the larger population of students. It makes the transition a little bit more seamless. They have the opportunity to be able to do it in more of a cohort style, and it's a little bit more intimate. They get to meet with student leaders. They get to meet with faculty and administrators. Um, ours is actually called Mosaic Preorientation. Uh, Mosaic has a whole other meaning, which I would love to share with you, but I don't have the time. But we'll have, a, you know, if you can follow up with us, uh, we can give you more information about that when we share our contact information. But see if see if the colleges and universities have um, pre-orientation programs for your students. And next, I'm going to pass it off to my main man, Daryl. Thank you, Doc. So the next question is about opportunities for off-campus, whether it's immersion things with off-campus study, short-term, long-term, public service, that sort of thing. I know that Gettysburg College is extremely rare in that we provide the round trip airfare for two semesters of off-campus study. The cost is literally the same as attending Gettysburg because all the grades and credits transfer. And there are funds, again, to cover any emergencies or contingencies. We also help students with fundraising or outright pay for them if they are leading immersion trips through our Center for Public Service. And any time a student has done research with a faculty member, the academic department actually flies that student with the faculty member to pay for their lodging, pay for their trip, to pay for them to help co-present at places that might be literally around the world for anything. And the last thing I'll talk about is summer research. A lot of times with the students we serve, there is a choice, summer job or research. After the first year at Gettysburg, students are able to do both. So we pay them, pay for their housing, and get them to do research instead of having to actually make a choice. Doc, back to you. All right, family. Um, so the next question is, what is the cost to have a social life on campus and what are the options and how varied are they? Uh, I will say, wow, <laughs> there can be a lot. Uh, you know, usually colleges and universities have student activities offices where they have student organizations um, that will have that, that kind of robust uh, campus life. There are also a lot of departments um, actually administrative departments that will provide um, co-curricular programming um, for, you know, Gettysburg College. We have about 120 student organizations on campus. Uh, they really hold a lot of social capital and do a phenomenal job creating um, a broad experience uh, for students here. Uh, we work a lot, and this is probably more co-curricular than social, but working with um, like the Center for Public Service who will do, um, they do break um, service programs, right? So they will go to different parts of the world to do service. Um, we have leadership programming, you know, so it's, again, it's, it's how you see social. Social should be, it should be beyond, you know, just movies and popcorn and pizza, but there should be also opportunities to learn in these co-curricular spaces. So you want to look for those um, when you're talking to like a student affairs or college life representative and what they have on campus. Um, next, I will pass it back to my colleague, Daryl. So here is part of what we want people to think about when it comes to preparing for life after graduation. 
Gettysburg College happens to enjoy a 98% placement rate into further careers in grad school within a year. And you can reach out to us to find out how, but the thing that we do is we make sure that it starts before classes even begin. So you will be in for to our Center for Career Engagement early to teach you how to interview, to teach you etiquette, to provide you even with a professional wardrobe so that if you need to interview, you can. So make sure the colleges and universities you're looking into are about providing you with all the tools that with at Gettysburg especially, you can use for the rest of your lives after graduation. Courtney? And we're just gonna share a little bit about Gettysburg. Um, and we've already touched on some of these statistics, but I, just traditions, make sure you're asking about traditions because this is what students will get to experience. And this building means so much to our campus. It's at the center of campus. It's where students start and have their convocation and it's where they, they end and have their commencement for graduation four years later. So this building um, at Pennsylvania Hall is pretty significant to our campus and our traditions. We've already talked about our amazing location, but our students from all over like having access to all of these um, urban urban areas but they like the the vibrant downtown of Gettysburg because it has shops and places for students to go um, some of our traditions revolve around town too uh, here you see pictured one of our our first traditions is the first year walk where they get to walk as a class through the town down the main street and have a guest of honor read the Gettysburg Address so they understand the context of where they're learning and where they're going to continue to grow over the next four years. Um, some of the quick facts, again, we've talked a lot about percentages, but we have 2,600 ama 2, amazing students from all over the world. They're all undergraduate, so they get all of the resources from the faculty and staff. They get our time, they get to do research, they get to go abroad. Um, it's a very, very much a residential campus, so everyone lives on campus. They're guaranteed housing all four years. Um, and they don't, they don't leave on the weekend. So especially for my West Coast students, they're, they're not gonna be there alone. About 90% of the students are there every single weekend. Our students are balancing about four classes and about three or four clubs and activities. And they, they run the campus. They're planning all the events on the weekends. And um, we have small class sizes, as you can see here, 17 is the average class size. Maybe the largest might be 30 to 40 for introductory courses and maybe the smallest around five. So it allows for those close, deep relationships with faculty. And that also allows for research. Over half of our students do individualized research with the faculty member. Uh, over 60% go abroad for a semester or more. It's the same cost as attending a semester at Gettysburg. Um, we have over 120 clubs and organizations and over 10 of these are affinity groups. So they will find their, their groups and, and produce some of their own events based around their, their own personal identity and culture. Um, some other big things to know is we have great financial aid and merit. I saw there was a question about merit, um, but this is something we include for all of our students, even if they're applying test optional. We have a STEM scholars program specifically for first generation students or students underrepresented in the STEM field. Um, and we really find that our students love being a part of the whole Gettysburg College community. They're very engaged and they're very involved. So um, that's just a quick little bit, but really what I am I have the honor of doing is introducing you to one of our very special seniors in this class of 2020. And she um, um, is very important to all of our offices and we know she's gonna do amazing things in the world, but here's, here's Tyra Riedemann to share her story with you. I, yeah, I, I think I think we're getting her getting her in the system, but um, here's here she comes. Here she yeah, comes. there we go. <laughs> is it is it my turn? It is yes, your turn. Are you, Tara? <laughs> um, thanks for introducing me, all. So when you guys asked me to speak a little bit about my Gettysburg experience, I thought of what the best way to kind of 
encompass all of those experiences opportunities would be. So I think maybe starting from my senior year of high school and kind of going into now being a current student. Um, so I'm currently a senior. My name is Tyra from New York City. I am a soon to be alum, which is really exciting. I'm a theater arts and cinema media studies double major. So if I could take you back to senior year of high school, I went to an all girls school in New York City. Um, it's called the Young Women's Leadership School of East Harlem. And through that school, we were we had a college bound program called the College Bound Initiative, CBI for short. Some of you may know it as the Student Leadership Network now. Um, but I was my college counselor at the time really put me on to Gettysburg um, and thought that it would be a good fit for me. And I was able to have my interview with Daryl Jones. Um, and just from my conversations with him, I was able to understand the dedication that the college had to kind of increasing diversity in all its facets and forms on campus. Um, and being a first generation college student, I wanted to go to a school that would provide me with resources and support, not only get me to campus, um, but that would help me make my way throughout these four years. So I first visited campus for Get Acquainted Today in 2016. And it was really nice because Daryl and the other, like the admissions office, they um, they rented out a charter bus for myself and like I think like maybe five or six other New York City students. Um, and we were able to make that trip down to Pennsylvania and see the campus. And that's something that my family and none of us drive. Um, and also like Amtrak tickets are expensive. Like we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that um, if it hadn't been for the admissions office and Daryl giving us the opportunity. Um, and Get Acquainted Today was a big reason why I decided to join the Gettysburg College community and enroll because I was able to talk to current faculty. I was able to meet Susan Russell, who is a professor in the theater arts department. Um, and she became my advisor once I became a student and we are so close even now. And I think Courtney, a, a thing that Courtney brought up was the fact that professors and students make relationships that are not just solely based on the academic piece, but it's also, we, we form personal bonds. Um, and so that's what I've been able to experience with Susan and other mentors and faculty members that I've gotten to know throughout these four years. Um, when I first came onto campus was the for the OME pre-orientation. So I was able to make friends who had similar lived experiences as me, who were also students of color, who were also first gen, um, who were also from like lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And we were all kind of figuring out <laughs> um, this college thing together. Um, which was really nice to make that sense of community right off the bat before classes even started. Um, and then once classes did start, I'll talk a little bit about my theater major. Um, my first year, I was really involved in the theater department. I was able to be in main stage plays and productions that the department was putting on. I was able, I was also able to be a part of a, a devised piece, which basically means the cast gets to write um, the play. And so we were able to write this whole play. And I was doing that as soon as my first year. And I had never written a play before, but it was just this sense of um, getting to collaborate with others who are also passionate about the same things that that I was, um, that was really neat to see that I could do as soon as my first year on campus. Um, and so the summer of 2017, I started working with the admissions office as a tour guide. Um, and that was like kind of one of the best experiences just because I was able to make friends with some of the other tour guides who were working that summer. And it not only broadened my sense of what the Gettysburg community looked like, because at that point I was really hanging with my friends I had made in the OME pre-orientation. But then once I was talking to juniors who were summer tour guiding, like seniors who were summer tour guiding, um, they were introducing me to other organizations that they had been a part of in their three or four years. So my, the sophomore year, I joined Alpha Phi Omega, which is a co-ed service fraternity on campus. Um, I also joined a social sorority. Um, and through that, I was able to become the vice president for the Panhellenic Council, which is kind of the council that oversees the sororities on campus. And then my goal as the VP was kind of to increase awareness about diversity in our social sororities and Greek organizations. And so I got to be the co-chair for the Greek Life Equity and Inclusion Committee. Um, so basically, establishing different diversity chairs for each Greek organization, um, helping figure out how do we make it uh, more welcoming for all different types of people, maybe not just like white, straight um, people on campus, right? Like how are we making it open and accessible to all people? Um, 
And so I also, then junior year, I became a visit, a program coordinator um, for multicultural recruitment underneath Daryl. Um, it was myself and Quinn Israel. And we were able to kind of help plan itineraries and help provide hosts um, with students who would be coming to visit campus and spend the night. And so I think I was able to see firsthand how committed the admissions office was to, like they, Daryl and Courtney and Darren have mentioned, like flying students out from different places so that they get a chance to see what it's like to be a student at Gettysburg. Um, so I, I feel really happy that I got to kind of aid in that in some way through being um, one of the program coordinators. Um, Junior year, I also added on my second major, so my cinema and media studies major, and I really got into like video production and filmmaking. Um, and I got one of my other advisors, Jim Udden, um, who was the chair of the Sims department. But I was really able to hone into like what different things I want to do. Um, and so summer of last year, so leading into my senior year, I was able to study abroad in Bath, England. Um, and that was phenomenal. I didn't think that I wanted to go abroad for a full semester just because I was so involved in the things that I was doing on campus. And I loved the life I created on campus that I didn't know if I was willing to leave it for four months. Um, but it was with the help of one of our vice provosts, Jack Ryan. Um, he brought up, he mentioned to me that there was a summer program um, hosted by like the advanced studies in, of the advanced studies in England, so ASE for short. And he mentioned that they were doing a two month long summer program um, and that there was also like a theater aspect to it that I would be able to like kind of um, have theater workshops and that would kind of hone in on my theater major. And it was, I, he also like funded um, the tuition cost for the program, um, which was amazing. So all my family and I really had to figure out how to pay was like my flight there and back. But the tuition cost of the program was basically covered, um, which was amazing. And so I got to go abroad. I got to um, do a three day workshop with like the troupe from the Royal Shakespeare Company, which was amazing <laughs> and something that I wouldn't have gotten necessarily um, being in the States and like being at Gettysburg. Um, and then I also got to visit the British Film Institute and check out all of their, their Criterion collection and all of that. And I'm kind of geeking out and like nerding out, but <laughs> that was like a highlight of my experience. Um, and then senior year, um, I came back onto campus and for last semester, for my theater capstone, I was able to do a direct a full two hour length play um, called Rabbit Hole by David Lindsay Abair. And I was able to work with a group of underclassmen um, who are my actors and direct them. And it was really a passion project for all of us. Um, and the, t the play, if you've ever heard of it, it deals with like some heavy subjects of love, forgiveness and family and all of that. But it was amazing to be able to kind of take that all the things I had learned throughout my four years and kind of put it into action um, directing, which was awesome. Um, and this semester, um, I was able to do my Sims capstone. And so I kind of did a recap experience of what my first gen experience at Gettysburg has been. I have to send that to Courtney and the rest of the admissions office. I totally forgot dealing with finals week, but um, I had different students who were also first gen send me like video clips and um, pictures of what their time at Gettysburg has looked like. And it, it kind of, my video kind of encompasses all of that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what my experience has been. And I've gotten to, I've been afforded all of these opportunities because of Gettysburg and I've gotten to do it with people who care about me, not only just as academically or as a number, or as a grade, but people who care about who Tyra is and like what I wanna do after graduation. Speaking of my time in the admissions office, um, I forgot to mention, but my senior year, I became a senior intern. So I was able to interview different students who are now part of the class of 2024. And I've throughout my time in the admissions office, I've kind of figured that admissions counseling is something that I want to do after graduation. Um, and it kind of encompasses all the things that I've learned in my theater major and in my Sims major. Um, this is kind of a tangent, but the idea of sense of performativity in terms of like set, like informing people about your school and about what it offers to you. Um, and then I got to work underneath Marco and Maggie. Maggie's not here, but Marco's living somewhere in the chat box. Um, and I, was able to work underneath them because they are the communications and marketing 
heads um, in the admissions office. So I was able to work with them on like social media strategy and see how that kind of combines my interest for my cinema and media studies major, um, like filmmaking, video production. So yeah, I've kind of found my passion, even though I wouldn't have ever thought about it coming in as a first year um, throughout my opportunities throughout my four years. So I hope that helped and you guys got a sense of like what it's like to be a first gen student at Gettysburg. We love you so much. And <laughs> thank you so much, Tyra. Um, we are gonna open it up to everyone for questions and we've seen some come through the uh, Q&A. And so um, I'm gonna please continue to, to ask and we're gonna try and get to a few before we have to close out. So the first one, I think there've been a, a lot of questions about financial aid, you know, especially what are some phrases to look for in reviewing packages that will let you know that it might not be guaranteed for all four years, just for one year? You know, what about international students? Do they get considered for both merit and uh, financial aid? So, um, Daryl, do you mind taking this one? Thanks, Courtney. So what you need to do is look for inclusive language with financial aid. And so part of that is having a face to face conversation or a phone conversation and making sure you get direct answers. We happen to be one of the places that is able to give aid to international students, which certainly helps with our diversity efforts. But again, as I mentioned earlier, if you hear somebody only talk about the first year, the average first year package, the grant to loan ratio in the first year, you need to take it upon yourselves to ask about the next three and to expect a straight answer. Look for guarantees. We all know how to see our way through nuance, and I wouldn't put this on our first gen students and families, but as educators, we can always say what happens with the next three years if finances stay the same, and what percentages have people change their financial aid if things differ. So it's on us to ask the questions. And with international students, that's a part of our student body and part of our diversity efforts at colleges and universities. So it very much should be part of how we disperse need-based financial aid. Thanks. And one of the next questions, um, someone was asking, uh, do you think it's appropriate for a, a student to a high school graduate to reach out to a staff member, a faculty member before orientation or course registration just um, to talk about some potential options? And I'll pass this to Darian. Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> Absolutely. The more the more that we could um, connect with students as they're in that transition process, right? So that June when they're done school and they're, and they're getting through the summer and getting gearing up to come in the fall, um, encouraging them to, and hopefully, you know, through your campus visits, those folks have shared business cards with you or contact information, um, push them to make those contacts um, to follow up. You know, if they have questions, definitely do that. Um, you know, we, we're there, we're there and we're available, but it is absolutely appropriate to do it. That's what we're here for. Um, we're here to answer those questions, but we're also, you know, here to help um, allay any fears that that students might have, and um, you know, let them get them excited about the fall. Um, that's that's really the purpose, right? So definitely, it's absolutely appropriate. Great. Um, I have another one that some some people were asking if a school doesn't have an emergency fund or you know a, a beautiful alumni that donate to to this type of programming what are some other resources or um, things that are available for these students to access additional funds in case of an emergency um, and again i'll just open it up to the to the group so so here's what i know you get nothing if you don't ask. So it's always okay to ask around the institution, whether it's a student's individual academic department or some other, is there a fund for me to be able to get to where I need to be if there is an emergency? But part of the reason why we're having this webinar is because we want you to ask that question in the beginning, not wait until a student is there. It is absolutely critical that you find out what the funding sources are before you enter because 
meeting need-based aid in terms of tuition and room and board is one thing, but being able to live the full experience is an entirely different animal if the other funds aren't there. Is there anything that you'd add to that, Doc? I would, I would just say sometimes it's it's natural for us to immediately go to financial aid, but those programs may not always be run by financial aid offices. So two areas I would definitely look at. Um, look at your um, student affairs area. Uh, they hold a lot of those kind of, if it's not an emergency fund, maybe there are pockets of funds of money that provide that type of support. Um, or look, some areas are, are moving towards this like student success model. Um, which would be a little different than the student affairs um, type of structure. The student success provides those types of support or maybe houses, um, secondary or tertiary programs that provide funding if there's not an institutional um, an institutional emergency fund. So I would look at, definitely look at those two areas. Again, financially might be able to point you in the right direction, but if they don't own a program like that, maybe again, they liaise with other offices, but the student access, student support areas, definitely the areas to look um, for some sort of funding. And, and if there's none available at all at the institution, maybe enough questions could be a catalyst for those areas to work with their development offices. And one of the things I've found that are really powerful um, relationships um, is the relationship that we have with our development office. So, you know, if they don't have it, you could really be a catalyst for them getting it and then pushing the envelope with their development officers. And for this last question, there was a question about having some virtual information sessions or how do I how do students and counselors get in touch with the admissions office over the summer um, and just throughout the year? And you can go to our website. Um, we have all of our contact information and where we travel. Um, we have our emails there, our phone calls. Please just reach out. But you will also see we've already started. We started interviews for juniors, virtual interviews. We have virtual info sessions. I'm hosting some West Coast Wednesdays. So if you're from the West Coast and you want to join me, I'm doing some specific West Coast information sessions um, throughout the summer on, on Wednesday. So uh, please use our, our website. We're constantly updating with some vir virtual opportunities and student panels and things like that. So um, thank you so much. And I think um, we are going to have Miss Brittany. <laughs> Thank you, team, so much. I, I wanted uh, to see say uh, you all have done such an excellent job. Um, for those of you who are in the audience, if you can please take some time out to complete the feedback survey. We're going to be sharing that with the Gettysburg team on what they do, uh, have done well and how they can improve today's presentation. Um, and we are recording. We will send over a um, email over to you all uh, with the slides as well. But before we go, um, Gettysburg, uh, can you all please just let us know any parting words um, that you would like to share with our audience today? So I'll um, start. <laughs> Sorry about that, Courtney. There is no such thing as a bad question. Ask the question that seems to be simple because the answer could indeed be a big one and a game changer. So never be shy about asking questions because we're your partners and we're here to help. Um, I was just going to say, especially for my, my West Coast counselors uh, and students, use me. I'm your person. I, I become your auntie for the students when you come to campus because I'm going to support you when you're on campus too. But especially now during this process, um, please connect with me if you if you want to set up something virtually. I'm happy to do that just one on one. Um, if you need us to present um, on any topics or um, I, I know I'm doing a, a few things over the summer with some specific groups. We are available. So please reach out and, and get in touch. I'm your person. I have, I have two words of wisdom. The first is shout out to everyone from Philly. I saw a few Philly folks, shout out. <laughs> um, but the second is um, really just this concept of community. Uh, folks, we are in this together to support these students. Um, it, going back to Courtney's message, utilize us, you know, we'll, we'll share our contact information, um, but we're only as good as the conversation that we're able to have with you. Uh, so use us. We're here. I tell students and, and prospective students in programs, um, you know, I always say when they get to Gettysburg, they have me. Um, but if they don't, 
uh, I'm, I'm a resource uh, for folks. And yes, shout out to Texas. I love Texas too. Um, enjoy time in San Antonio. So yes, shout out to Texas. Uh, but absolutely, we, we're in this education game together to support these students, to help them realize their dreams. So stay connected, um, stay empowered. And if you ever get down, give us a holler. We will pick you back up and, and continue to move collectively uh, to, the, to the end goal for these folks. So thank, thank you so much. And thank you, Gettysburg team, um, Tyra, um, Daryl, Darian, Courtney, Tyra, C, and Marco in the chat. Um, you all have put together such a really great um, presentation and the amount of um, hours, heart, sweat, um, and effort. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will be resuming um, our professional development series next fall. But um, in the meantime, we are still uh, carrying out our college block party uh, next uh, June. So next month, June 3rd, June 4th, mark your calendars. We are inviting Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, University of Michigan, and University of Chicago to talk um, about topics around essay writing, around test optional schools, um, really helping students with uh, their narrative and how having that uh, really uh, hold uh, true uh, throughout their application. Um, and we really are excited about um, you all um, uh, who are new to our platform. Um, thank you so much. Please share uh, College Greenlight um, and uh, our resources. We appreciate you all so much. Thank you to all of our advocates on the ground um, and working hard to create a better world for our students and their families and their future families. So um, College Greenlight, signing off. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.